What are you doing? I waited for you. Come on, get inside. There's Germans everywhere out here. All right, all right. But hurry up. Oh, oh. <laughs> of course. What are you doing? It's me Bren gun. Yeah, I know it's your Bren gun. Honestly. Yeah. Wait, hold on a sec, where's your spare barrel? Spare barrel? Well, yeah, you're supposed to have a lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. The British Expeditionary Force of 1918 was perhaps the most professional and capable army the Empire had ever seen. Masters of combined arms warfare, its divisions had finally been able to crack the German defenses of the Western Front and recapture the territory that had been lost in the initial German offensives of 1914. One aspect of this mastery was what became a full introduction, appreciation and exercise of a suite of infantry tactics manifesting itself at the platoon level. What had begun in the aftermath of the Battle of the Somme in 1916 was by 1918 a well-practiced paradigm that enabled the infantry platoon of some 40 men, hitherto a simple subordinate of the company, to effectively operate independently at a tactical level. Far and away, the weapon that facilitated this tactical revolution was the Lewis gun. Delivering mobile, timely and intermittent fire support, the Lewis gun allowed for a fully realized and mature system of fire and movement to become the hallmark of infantry work, culminating during the Hundred Days campaign, which ended the war in November of 1918. In most cases, there were up to two Lewis guns in each platoon, enabling up to two separate targets or enemy positions to be dealt with simultaneously if required. Moving under the cover of Lewis fire and a shower of rifle grenades, the riflemen of the platoon could maneuver and close with the enemy using the rifle, bayonet and bomb to finish the job. As the peace of the interwar period began, this organization was maintained. But as the storm clouds gathered over Europe once again, a new weapon was going to be required to fit the modern, mechanized army that was being built from the mid-1930s. Fitting it into a new tactical model of a platoon based on three sections instead of four, but each of which would be identical instead of the two Lewis and two rifle sections of the older model, this new weapon would give each section its own ability to generate automatic fire for attack or defense. In fact, it was to become the most important arm within the section and the infantry in general. This new weapon was given a name to reflect its Czech and British origins. The city of Brno, in then Czechoslovakia, had been the location of the factory from which the original design had come from. And the Royal Small Arms Factory at Enfield was where the design had been finalized and where this new weapon would be made. Taking the first two letters of each location, one of the most iconic weapons of the Second World War would become known as the Bren light machine gun. It would see service in every theatre of the war, around the world in the British and Commonwealth armies after it, and would soldier on in modified form incredibly into the 1990s. The Bren remains to this day one of the most iconic weapons of the Second World War. The men who carried it would remark on its reliability and effect. Whether it was in the green fields of Normandy, or the scorching sand of the western desert, the steamy heat of a Burmese jungle, or the frigid snows of Norway, the Bren Gunner held the heavy responsibility of not only carrying its weight, but delivering its fire. Next to the section commander, he was arguably the most important man in the infantry section, as without him, the most important weapon of that section would be out of action. The Bren served throughout the war, from the heady but cautious days of the Phony War to the evacuation of Dunkirk, during the desperate days during and after the Battle of Britain, to the epic struggle back and forth across North Africa and the eventual assault 
on the so-called soft underbelly that was Italy. It soldiered in the monsoons of the Far East and the rocky Mediterranean. It parachuted from the sky and landed in boats. It crossed rivers and wound up deep in the enemy's homeland when Germany surrendered in 1945. When Japan capitulated some months later, the Bren was ready to accompany the British and Commonwealth infantry massing for the possible invasion of that country. Truly an iconic weapon worthy of its reputation. In order to fully understand the Bren light machine gun, we must first look to the past and see how the concept of the light machine gun grew to maturity with the British and Empire armies. As mentioned in the introduction, the Lewis had occupied a place integral to the infantry platoon, enabling it to provide for its own automatic supporting fire, which could be used to allow maneuver in action. By 1917, the platoon was organized as such, containing four sections, each with its own task on the battlefield. Commanded by the platoon commander, a lieutenant, and a small number of assisting personnel, the platoon was broken into a rifle bomb section, the rifle section, the bomber section, and the Lewis section. In this diagram, we can see the theory in practice. Attacking a German strong point, we can see the headquarters and the four sections of the platoon arrayed before the enemy. With the platoon commander observing, but arguably he be leading the assault, the Lewis section is firing directly at the enemy. The rifle bombers are firing their bombs high in the air over the heads of the bomber section who are maneuvering onto the objective. On the left, the rifle section further developed the supporting fire. Alternately, they could be kept as a reserve, or they could reinforce and attack with the bombers, depending on the situation. Off to the left flank, some scouts protect that vulnerable area. This was the general infantry paradigm of the late stages of the Great War, once the barrage lifted and enemy resistance was encountered. By war's end, often there could be up to two Lewis guns available, which would allow for two independent actions to occur within the platoon construct. This organization was codified in the post-war army, and the four-section platoon, consisting of two rifle and two Lewis sections, would serve until the late 1930s. At that point, a significant restructure of the infantry occurred, and the doctrine surrounding light machine gun, or light automatic, as it was then known, shifted from a platoon focus to the section. In the aftermath of the Great War, numerous experiments and trials were conducted with a view to perhaps finding a replacement for the Lewis, which although had arguably been the right weapon at the right time, had some limitations. In the 1920s, familiar names such as the BAR, the Madsen, the Hotchkiss, and perhaps the less well-known Breadmore Farquhar were all tested at one point or another. Apparently, the BAR was the arm that drew the most attention. However, the army of the 1920s had little stamina and even less money for projects that would see brand new weapons produced in the face of massive stockpiles of Great War vintage arms. The eventual adoption of the Bren had its embryonic moment in 1930, when the War Office directed the Small Arms Committee to find a replacement, finally, for both the Lewis and the Vickers. This trial would see a considerable number of light machine guns put to the test. For this, the Lewis would be used as the control. There were two configurations of the Browning automatic rifle used in the test, as well as the Swiss KE-7. The Vickers Berthier, two types of Madsen, and a Czech offering, the ZB-26. It would be this last weapon which would rise to the top of the list, and after extensive trials, modifications, and design adaptations would evolve into the Bren. With the committee selection of the ZB-26, a nearly seven-year program was initiated, which would eventually bring the weapon to bear in its final form. The 1930 trial actually featured a slightly improved version of the gun, the ZB-27, which had been sent along by the Czechs for purposes of the evaluation. What followed was a progressively improved and adapted series of weapons, each having slight differences and improvements. These first early patterns were chambered in 792 Mauser, the German round, 
and although excellent performers, there was no capacity to accommodate this type of ammunition within the British infantry. 303 was still the service cartridge, and commonality, especially at the platoon and company level, was considered essential. So 303 it would be. The ZB-30 version of the Czech gun was rechambered to 303, initially with a shorter 20-round magazine, and the gun maintained its place as the number one contender. You can see here the curved shape of the magazine to contend with the rimmed 303 round. Another significant cosmetic change was made in the form of moving the gas block back to the midway point along the barrel. The ZB-33 version of the gun featured a new 30-round magazine, and the distinctive silhouette of the Bren began to mature. Various other incremental changes were made, including sights, internals, and the deletion of the cooling fins hitherto present on the barrel. By 1937, the gun had received its new name, and plans and facilities were developed at Enfield to manufacture the first of what would be known as the Mark I Bren. The first Mark I Bren was completed at Enfield on September 3rd, 1937, though it took a year to enter official service. With war looming and the re-equipping of the army, both British and Commonwealth, a by now foregone necessity, contracts were let to the John Inglis Company of Toronto, Ontario. With that, Canada became a major producer of the Bren from that point on throughout the entire war. The Bren would also be manufactured in Australia and India. Throughout the wartime years, there would be changes and modifications for one reason or another. Perhaps a short overview of the patterns of Bren gun. The Mark I Bren represented the pattern of gun that equipped the BEF and subsequently the armies of the Commonwealth nations at the beginning of the war. This design was perhaps the most complete as envisaged by the designers. Although the general silhouette of the gun changed very little during its service life, there were a few features on the Mark I that made it stand out. The front of the barrel consisted of a one-piece combined gas block and flash eliminator, made in stainless steel, giving a distinctive silvery hue to the muzzle. It featured adjustable bipod legs and an intricate machining of flutes on the gas cylinder. The sleeve of the carrying handle was perforated, and interestingly, there was a dovetail on the left side of the body, built to accept a so-called fixed line sight for use with the tripod for nighttime or obscured target firing on a fixed line. The back sight was a complex piece featuring a rotating drum for adjustment, and to the butt were fitted a butt strap to steady the weapon in the shoulder, and a butt handle for the left hand to hold while firing. Here we can see some of these and other features from a different angle. In addition, the gas shield, intended to deflect gas away from the number two, was of a complex cupped shape. Here we can see the butt strap deployed for use, and the butt handle below. As well, an example of the gas shield with its concave surface. This is the gun that went with the BEF to France and would equip its divisions during the Phony War and the Battle of France. The campaign of 1940 did not go well, as we are all familiar with. The disaster that befell France cost her dearly, losing her sovereignty. For the British, forced back upon the coast, the evacuation of Dunkirk, of a huge part of the BEF, resulted in the loss of nearly all the Bren guns in France. There had been 30,000 Brens manufactured to date, and staggeringly, 27,000 had been lost or left on the wrong side of the English Channel. Clearly, there was a production emergency. Immediately, changes were initiated to speed up production, which would result in not a new weapon, but one that was simplified. This became known as the Mark I Modified. Outwardly similar, it lacked some of the finer points of the original design. The butt strap was eliminated and no butt handle fitted. The fitting for the latter remained as this was integral to the use of the tripod, which was still, in the early war period, intended for use. Many lightning cuts on the body and gas cylinder were dispensed with, and the bipod legs were of a new pattern, lacking the ability to adjust. The dovetail bracket on the left side of the body was done away with. Not only was it too complex a process to make, but also the whole concept of fixed-line firing was proven to be an unnecessary luxury that had been seldom used, if ever. Another important aspect of the Mark I Modified 
was that various parts did not necessarily conform to the new simplified standard. Parts that were still available, already manufactured, were used up and fitted to the newly manufactured guns, as we can see here. In this series of photos, we can see the specific differences between the Mark I and the Mark I modified. There were also some design issues that had become apparent during the fall of France, including fouling collecting at the bipod sleeve, which would immobilize it after heavy firing. This would also have an impact with the gun's reliability and rate of fire. This resulted in a re-evaluation of the design, and two parallel projects were embarked on, funnily enough entitled Project A and Project B. Project A would become the Mark I modified, and Project B would feature enough changes to warrant a whole new designation, the Mark II. Although at its core still the same gun, differences included a redesigned butt without the contour for the butt strap, a ladder type backsight to replace the drum style pattern, a simplified non-folding cocking handle, a carrying handle sleeve without perforations, a non-adjustable bipod, a flat gas shield, and a redesigned barrel with separate gas block and flash eliminator. These were produced from 1941 in both the UK and Canada. The Mark II didn't replace the Mark I, but rather augmented it, albeit in ever-increasing numbers, and examples of the Mark I modified Bren were seen throughout the war. By 1943, there was breathing room to consider further modifications to the design. Primarily driven by the intent of lightening the gun, these efforts resulted in the Mark III, manufactured from mid-1944, in the UK only. Initially intended for more specialized operations such as airborne and jungle fighting, changes were made to the butt with an even further streamlined shape, a return to the folding cocking handle, lightning cuts made to the body, a lighter profile barrel, a slightly redesigned flash eliminator, and both non-adjustable and the older Mark I style adjustable bipod was used in the manufacture. Now, there was a Mark IV brand designed and produced during the war. Essentially, a lightened Mark II. There were only 250 made. As they saw little or no use, only a mention is made here. Post-war, with less stress on the Exchequer and more resources at hand, Mark II Brens were sent for factory thorough repairs, or FTR, and during this refurbishment the Mark I style cocking handle was retrofitted. This modification became known as the Bren Mark II slash 1. So those were the various patterns of Bren produced throughout and immediately after the war. It is critical to understand that at no time did one pattern replace another. Simply, manufacturing changed. Different types of Brens could be found side by side and in any theatre at a given appropriate time. A Bren was a Bren in the eyes of the army. The Bren was issued with a wide suite of ancillary equipment which filled a number of requirements. These were both for administrative and field use. The chest was a simple workmanlike affair which was designed for transit or prolonged storage. It had provision for the gun, cleaning stores and the like, and theoretically was carried in the platoon truck while in the field. The spare parts wallet held the supplies for immediate support of the Bren and included cleaning materials, simple tools, and spare small parts such as firing pins and springs. This was carried by the number one. The hold all was a somewhat larger item which had provision for, in its outer pockets, the spare parts wallet previously discussed, further cleaning materials and lubricants, a cleaning rod for the gas chamber, and importantly, the spare barrel. This, while commonly not carried in the field at section level, was intended to supplement the Bren when used on the tripod in a fixed line shooting scenario. The section was issued a set or two of what were termed utility pouches. These were of common 37 pattern style construction and were joined by a wide strap at their top and a thinner version to steady the pair of pouches on the body as shown here. While basic 37 pattern pouches could hold two magazines for the Bren, and indeed every man would be doing so, the utility pouches were somewhat bigger and could accommodate three magazines in each. 
the prescribed method had the pouches asymmetrically hung over one shoulder and the haversack on the back, but in the field it would seem that they were carried in a somewhat more informal way, often being carried around the neck. As we can see here, the steadying strap was often left undone or removed. Of course, the section was not limited to just one pair, and these pouches were used for many different natures of ammunition. It would seem that their use, while present in most documentation, was not as universal as one might expect. They show up in photographs, mostly in either the very early war period in France, or during the Normandy invasion and fighting of that campaign. They are rarely seen in the western desert, or in later fighting in the Low Countries or Germany. They are conspicuously absent from photos taken in Burma as well. Now, this isn't to say that they weren't used, but rather simply to put a bit of context to their use. Perhaps, in more mature campaigns, it was simply found that they were a bit redundant, and that other arrangements were just as effective. One final caveat to the use of utility pouches. It would seem that the original intent was not to carry existing ammunition, but rather to use the pouches to collect magazines from other members of the section, i.e. they would be carried empty. While this may have indeed been the intent, photographic evidence seems to suggest that for the most part the pouches were full, indicating that they were carrying, most logically, additional ammunition. The tripod was issued with every gun and was intended to fill two roles, fixed line firing and anti-aircraft use. A cleverly designed device, it enabled the Bren to be laid on a specific target when visibility of that target was blocked or hampered by smoke or darkness. Regardless of its ultimate utility, it proved for a very stable platform when properly deployed. For use in static positions, a simple sheet metal box was issued which held 12 magazines in a rack fixed within. Notwithstanding its use as the only way to carry multiple magazines before the issue of 37 pattern webbing, it was typically not used when on the move due to its bulk and weight. It was commonly found in use in the aforementioned anti-aircraft role close at hand to the number two. As mentioned earlier, the Bren arrived in service at a time when there were many other changes happening within the British Army. The years from 1937 to 1939 were incredibly fast-paced as the war clouds began to gather. There would be new weapons like the Bren and the boys anti-tank rifle, new organizations in the rifle platoon, reduced to three sections but with increased complement of machine guns, new uniforms in the form of battle dress, new anti-tank guns in the two-pounder and 25mm Hotchkiss, and overall, the army dragged itself finally out of the era of the horse and began to mechanize. The infantry, although still relying on their feet for movement, would see a huge increase in motor vehicles for logistics and supporting roles. Every platoon would have a truck for extra ammunition and kit. Perhaps a short discussion on how the Bren fit into the order of battle of the infantry. The section was the smallest grouping on the battlefield in 1939. It consisted of eight men. A corporal commanded and was armed with the rifle initially. Later he would carry a tommy gun, and later still a sten. Next was the Bren team consisting of the number one and the number two. The number one carried the gun, ammunition, and spares kit, while the number two carried ammunition. The remainder of the section consisted of riflemen, who, while armed with rifles, also carried magazines for the Bren. The early war section was still looked upon as a single entity, and no further breakdown was prescribed. The Bren was the focus of the section, and it formed the center of any maneuver or action on the battlefield. It was this Orbat that the British Army went to war with, and it lasted essentially until after Dunkirk. In this early war diagram, you can see the doctrine illustrated. The Bren is engaging the enemy, directed by the section commander. Note the remainder of the section who are arranged around the Bren, but are not actively engaging the enemy. Rather, they are so placed to provide ammunition and to protect the Bren from enemy action. A platoon was made up of three sections, each identical. These were grouped under a platoon headquarters, commanded by a lieutenant, second lieutenant, or commonly in the early war, by a warrant officer class 3 or platoon sergeant major, due to a lack of officers. 
To assist, there was a sergeant to act as second in command. There was a two-inch mortar detachment and a boy's anti-tank rifle, though this was not crude and simply issued to a section as required. To carry their kit and extra ammunition, a 1,500-weight truck was provided. The infantry company combined three such platoons and a small headquarters. Thus, the infantry company contained nine Bren guns. Initially, these were all equipped with the tripod, but this fell quickly out of use for fixed-line firing. By 1941, there had been some subtle changes made to the organization of the infantry. The strength of the section was raised to ten men. This led to a change in the way the section was led and utilized in the field. It would take some time to increase to this establishment, and many examples exist through the mid-war period of sections operating with a strength of eight or fewer. This is also illustrated notwithstanding the use of some peculiar section orbats in North Africa during the mid-war period. Please note that while the dates shown here reflect the change in orbat of the section, they do not reflect the adoption of the weapons illustrated, namely the Sten and the number 4 rifle. These entered service from 1943 and are thus reflective of the latter part of the war. Still commanded by a corporal, the section was divided into two groups. The section commander and six riflemen formed the rifle group, while the section second in command, a lance corporal, and the Bren number one and two formed the Bren group. Coincidal with this, the tactical options available to the section began to mature. With dedicated junior NCOs in command of both groups, the section was now able to split into a fire element and a maneuver element. This represented the embryonic stages of the development of small unit tactics with which we might be familiar today. The Bren was capable of delivering a high volume of accurate fire and would be relied upon to engage and kill or neutralize the enemy. This would enable the rifle group to maneuver and close with the enemy using their mobility, rifle, bomb, and bayonet. The section level attack could now be realized. These low-level tactics were taught through the use of what was termed battle drill. While a vehicle for training in barracks and appearing extraordinarily formal and rehearsed, battle drill nevertheless taught the basic understanding of the related concepts of fire and maneuver. Here we can see the battle drill version of the rifle group assaulting the enemy position across the front of the Bren group. Building on these basic concepts, training would then develop up to full live fire schemes. There is a video on field firing of the Second World War here on the channel for those interested. While a full-blown examination of British and Empire infantry tactics is not the subject of this video, it is nevertheless important to understand the context of the use of the Bren within that arm. With the enemy located, it was the job of the Bren to engage and kill or neutralize the enemy. The Bren group would be deployed by the section commander to the best location for that to happen. The remainder of the Bren group set to work controlling the fire, collecting necessary ammunition, and supplying the gun. With the enemy engaged and either put to ground or killed, the rifle group could now move to an advantageous position to effect the assault. This would usually be undertaken from a flank if possible. With the Bren group working together, the fire generated would cover the rifle group across exposed terrain until such times as their close assault could take place. Under the direction of the Section 2 IC, fire would either stop or switch to a new target as the rifle group closed in. The number of Bren guns in the infantry company did not change throughout the war, one per section. Organization and tactics changed to a degree, but the firepower of the Bren remained the foundation of infantry action. 
If the importance of the Bren within the section was of the utmost, the mechanism by which it was kept in action was equally so. Leading into the war, there was considerable leeway given in doctrine for the carrying of ammunition. In the 1938 PAM Infantry Section Leading, it gave a somewhat nebulous solution to the section allotment of Bren ammunition. Although not actually prescribed, three magazines would generally seem to be regarded as a standard load for every man in the section, in addition to his own 50 rounds for his rifle. This would seem to be corroborated in the early war training film The Platoon in the Attack. The film goes into some detail in describing the textbook loads carried by every man in the platoon, and the section in particular. Here, each man in the section is prescribed three magazines, with the exception of the section commander. This gives a total of some 588 rounds in 21 magazines carried amongst the section. This should be understood to reflect that 28 rounds was the standard number of rounds put into the magazine, two less than its capacity to help alleviate stoppages caused by excessive spring pressure on the rounds when fully loaded. With the coming of the gradual post-Dunkirk growth of the section to 10 men, and as prescribed in the 1944 book Infantry Training Part 8, the rifle group carried a somewhat reduced load, while the Bren group an increased one. Riflemen carried two magazines, while the Bren group carried between four and five each. This gave an increased round count to 700 rounds carried in 25 magazines within the section. Now perhaps it's important to contextualize this number. They were based on a theoretical requirement, and, as always, there was provision made for local or situational deviation. Most anecdotal sources speak of two magazines per rifleman, but even these need to be placed in the context of what they were doing and where they were going. Certainly, there were instances of increased numbers of magazines taken into action for specific tasks, such as a raid by commandos or in defense of a given locality, where an overly large expenditure of ammunition would be anticipated. Now, there is a little bit more detail that we perhaps could add to this. With the early war prescription for three magazines, one pouch would be filled, and the other mostly so. Now, add the other items typically carried, including a 50-round bandolier and a number 36 grenade or other type, you can see that there is not enough room to carry it all. By reducing the number of magazines carried by the rifle group to two per man, a complete pouch is left empty and can easily carry a bandolier and two grenades. We should clarify this a bit in mentioning that anecdotally a second bandolier would often be carried for the express use of refilling magazines. While the bandolier for the man's rifle would be slung over the shoulder in action, the pouch would hold the other 50-round bandolier for magazine filling. Perhaps worth a brief mention, in the spirit of the paradigm at the outset of the Bren service life, is the cavalry. Perhaps unknown to some, the cavalry, mounted on horses, was still a part of the military in the late 1930s. The last regiment to mechanize was the Royal Scots Grays in 1941, while posted to the Middle East. The Bren formed the basics of cavalry firepower as it did in the infantry. The cavalry, as they had been in the Great War, had made the transition to a balance of fire and shock tactics, and throughout the interwar period this was maintained. The Bren was issued in a rather reduced scheme of one per troop in the cavalry, and the gun was carried in a bucket on the off side of the saddle. Another key aspect of the use of the Bren was its inclusion on armoured vehicles. Perhaps the place to start is with that well-known and ubiquitous vehicle, the Universal Carrier. Sometimes known as the Bren Carrier, this vehicle was found in every theatre, on every battlefield, throughout the entire war. The Carrier had provision for mounting the Bren in numerous positions, including through a hatch at the front, and on a selection of mounts in the rear of the vehicle, including taller versions for anti-aircraft work. The carrier was used for a myriad of roles, from a tractor towing anti-tank guns to transporting mortars. Within the infantry, there was a dedicated platoon within the battalion, funnily enough called the Carrier Platoon, which was intended to be a mobile reserve of firepower and consisted of 10 to 13 carriers, depending on what time of the war you were looking at, and represented a huge concentration of weaponry. 
The Bren was used, especially in the early to mid-war time frame, as an anti-aircraft weapon on armored vehicles. To this end, many different mounts were devised which enabled the Bren to point skywards, often aimed by the commander in his cupola. The anti-aircraft role was not only found within the armored corps. The Bren formed the backbone of the ground forces capability. Found in the early and mid-war period on the Bren tripod configured in the anti-aircraft role, the Bren was crewed by two men supplied with liberal amounts of ammunition. Often used in this role were the 100-round drum magazines. These were spring-loaded rotating affairs which were quite complex and generally too heavy and unwieldy for use in the field by the infantry section. Infantry or ground-based use of the Bren in the anti-aircraft role gradually waned as the war progressed. Improved anti-aircraft weapons and most importantly the neutralization of the Luftwaffe by the RAF and the USAAF nullified the need for emphasis on such low-level and arguably low-effect measures. Training for the Bren gun was undertaken by all ranks of the infantry from the earliest outset of their training. The drills, techniques and procedures for basic and advanced handling, cleaning and the use of the tripod were contained in the pamphlet Small Arms Training Volume 1, Number 4, The Light Machine Gun. This volume was published in 1939 and again with revisions along with the vast majority of the Small Arms series in 1942. There were also PAMs published in Australia and India, which could differ in small details. Coupled with these were two others of the series, number one, weapon training, and number two, application of fire. Now these topics themselves will be covered in the next video, but suffice it to say that the basics of the use of the Bren gun were taught and practiced in accordance with these manuals. Of a recruit's training, well over 11 hours were spent learning the Bren, and throughout the training literature of the era, it was continuously emphasized that the Bren was the foundation of infantry firepower. Every man was taught its use so that if in action the number one fell, there would be a man ready to take his place. After successful completion of the applicable training, a series of tests, termed tests of elementary training, were undertaken to ensure the drills and handling were efficient. Following this, the recruit commenced their range work. The wartime Bren course had seven practices, six from 1942, and covered most of the basic aspects of light machine gun use, including application, rapid, and an introduction to anti-aircraft firing, as well as shooting in respirators, all out to 500 yards. A presentation of this range course will obviously form part of a subsequent video. Targetry used for the bread practices matched that used for the rifle. For the wartime range course, a smaller four-foot target was used to 300 yards. Earlier in the war, this was a simple two-tone ringed target with a tin hat style aiming mark. From 1942, this was replaced with a gray version featuring a number five figure as the bull and aiming mark. For 500 yard practices, a large or six-foot target was used. Earlier in the war, this was of the so-called convertible landscape style, featuring a stylized landscape and sky. From 1942, this was replaced with a more conventional grey ringed target, with a brown central number three figure as a bull. It was these type of targets that were used for the so-called conventional shooting, that is to say, the qualifying practices shot by all men. For field firing, the family of standalone figure targets was used. The number 2, 3, 4A, and 5 being the most common. The various landscape targets used for close-range harmonization shooting could also be used for preliminary training, providing a useful selection of targets to aim at. Now, the wartime use of the Bren is obviously the focus of this series, but mention needs to be made of its use post-war. The Bren continued to hold its place as the primary light machine gun of the army throughout the 1950s. It was used in Korea by all Commonwealth forces and served in notable battles such as Kapyong, the Imjin River and the Hook. Commonwealth forces were at a distinct disadvantage due to the general lack of close quarter automatic weapons with which to confront the Chinese so-called hugging tactics. The Bren became even more important to the infantry section. The Bren served on till the end of the 303 era when a new caliber was introduced, the 7.62mm NATO round. 
initially serving unaltered alongside the new FN self-loading rifle as adopted by all Commonwealth armies in the very late 1950s. It was supplanted by a heavy barrel version of the FN rifle in Canada and, to a lesser extent, Australia. In British service, the Bren was modified to use the new NATO ammunition and thereupon gained a whole new life in a supplementary role to the newly introduced FN general purpose machine gun, which became the main machine gun of the infantry. Initially, a modified Mark III, but later on, the Mark II Bren was so modified, this version became known as the L4 and was used as a handier alternative to the belt fed general purpose machine gun. While this is not an exhaustive history, the L4 served around the world. In Northern Ireland, where its magazine-fed characteristic was more appropriate at times for low-intensity operations. Famously, it was used alongside its newer cousin during the Falklands War of 1982, where the Royal Marines, long accustomed to using it in Norway, carried it as a second light machine gun in their sections. The L4 was to have its operational swan song during the Gulf War of 1991, when it was used by supporting troops of the Royal Artillery and the Royal Signals, amongst others, who had yet to convert to the SA-80 family of 5.56mm weapons. The 7.62mm Bren also serves in the Indian Army, and thereby has guaranteed the Bren's service into the 21st century. This concludes Part 1 of the Bren series here on the channel. In Part 2, we'll examine the training regime undertaken by recruits and trained soldiers alike during the Second World War. The references used in this series are the Bren Gun Saga by Thomas Dugalby, the Osprey book The Bren Gun by Neil Grant, and of course the myriad of training manuals as digitized by the Vickers Machine Gun Collection and Research Association. The man behind the association, Rich Fisher, has provided an incredible body of reference material to the historical shooting community. In addition, he also gave me the opportunity to fire my very first Bren Gun. His efforts to preserve history rank amongst the very best, and he is a great friend of the channel. This video would not have been made had it not been for C and Arsenal and their incredible close-knit community of friends. My undying thanks and appreciation go to all those who, by hook or by crook, or by the kindness of their hearts, decided to contribute as they could to make my visit such a success. Your hospitality, energy, generosity and expertise are beyond reproach. I'd like to thank Sven in particular, who lent the use of his Bren and sourced considerable quantities of ammunition. Without you, the Bren episodes would be dead in the water. Athias, May, Susie, David, Kristen, Sven, Hill, Jeff, Thomas, Henry, Aiden, and Bruno. You all spent untold hours of wrangling and sourcing the 14.5 million things that were needed to bring this project to fruition. I am truly humbled. In addition, thanks must be extended to James and the staff at the Seaforth Highlanders of Canada Museum and Archive for making available some of the arms seen in this project for photography and use. If you'd like to support the channel, please stop by our Patreon page. The link is in the description below. For more information on projects and updates between videos, 
follow us on our Facebook page. What was once Utreon is now Player. It still remains a good alternative to YouTube and Patreon, as those platforms have become rather troublesome for content has found on this channel. May I suggest following British muzzleloaders there as well.